I want to bring in the Shadow Climate Change and Energy Minister, Ted O'Brien, now. Uh, Ted, uh, good to see you. Um, there's been plenty of reaction, which you would have seen most of. There's a big question still about the cost. We're trying to get to the, to the bottom of that. We spoke to uh, Tim Buckley last hour. He said this is roughly a plan that could cost around $100 billion. Is that anywhere near the vicinity of what you've got in mind? Great to be with you, Laura, and thanks for having us back. Yesterday, we announced as a coalition our plan around locations, the institutional architecture, uh, the plan to establish a civil nuclear program. Um, in later iterations of our policy release, we will be talking about the economics. Um, uh, and so we'll, we'll have that conversation then. But mm. if I can make this point, in response to, um, I didn't see the Tim Buckley interview, but nevertheless, what's key here is value for money. Uh, cost is absolutely important, but it is just one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is the benefits that accrue. And in this case, we are talking about cheaper, cleaner and consistent 24-7 power. Right. So is your plan going to produce cheaper and cleaner energy than the government's renewable plan when it all comes to, together uh, in 2050? Without, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, Laura, uh, we wouldn't be doing it otherwise. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of experts that say that Labor's plan wouldn't work anyway, but uh, let's just give them the better for the doubt and say, let's just say from an engineering perspective, somehow they could make their plan work. The fact that they have up to 28,000 kilometres of transmission lines, all of which have to land on your power bill at home and small business power bills, for example, um, it just shoots the price through the roof. And it is why Australia is the only nation venturing down the path that Labor has set here. No other country is even thinking about doing what Labor is doing. Um, What's that? And so, what are you talking about yeah, exactly Part of the reason there? is the economics don't stack up. 82% renewables yeah, no, by question. 2030? Uh, so the 82% renewables by 2030 and then up to nearly 100% thereafter. Um, a, a grid, an electricity grid, that is predominantly reliant on weather-dependent technologies of wind and solar, not alone, mm. but overly reliant. Um, that that creates system problems and increases costs sure. exponentially. But aren't you ignoring and the use this of batteries is what we're there already seeing. and the, the emergence in battery technology and that they're no. doubling their capacity all the time? Uh, uh, Laura, no, not at all. And you make a really good point because uh, batteries are going to be key mm. and we're yet to release our renewables policy, our gas policy and other aspects. Uh, yeah. What you will see is we will definitely be leaning into the importance of storage and that okay. includes batteries. All right. So when all is said and done, um, OK, I accept that you, you're not, not telling us the cost yet, but when all is said and done, if you were able to get these seven plants up and running, what percentage of our power system would that provide? Would that be 10 or 20 per cent? And for the rest of it, say the 80 per cent, would that still be renewables? Uh, Laura, I, unfortunately, I have, to, I have to disappoint you with this one too, because that will be part of our future release. And the reason for that is this. Yeah. Um, we are wanting to focus right now on the nuclear part of our policy, um, but yeah. we are yet to release the renewables and the gas. Fair enough, Only but you must you do know, that, then, then you must you say have this some idea. Mix. You must have some idea of the capacity of these seven nuclear power plants when they are when they are fully up and running. Would that be around twenty percent of our total power capacity? Again, Laura, uh, I, I won't be going into the mm. percentage of the energy mix at this point, at this point. Do you um, not, do but you, we, do we you have not been doing really a lot of work know on this. Yet? Uh, I know you have been doing a lot of work and, look, I don't expect all, all, the, all of the details right now, but you've got to have some idea of what, uh, you know, uh, seven power plants would provide in terms of energy. 
People need to know that, especially before the next election, don't they? So, uh, again, Laura, we will release the, the economics, we release mm. the energy mix and so forth in due course well ahead of the next election. Because you make a fair point. Of course, people um, need to know the answers to these things. Um, mm. But the, the approach we have taken is to put consumers at the centre, making sure that, yes, the lights have to stay on, we have to decarbonise, but we've got to get these prices down um, and what consumers and uh, households will see is a far cheaper and cleaner approach of yeah. constant 24-7 power than Labor it can, can it possibly deliver. But if you can't answer those two former questions, how do you know it will be cheaper? Uh, we will answer those questions. We're just saying you haven't released it yet, Laura. <laughs> right, I'm so you know, but you don't about, want to tell us yet. Sort of, let, me, let me see if I can answer. <laughs> let, let, me, let, let, me, let me see if I can partly make you happy by Please. talking about our approach with having two establishment projects as the starting point of the deployment. Okay. So here we would have, by 2035, the first electricity coming onto the Australian grid from small modular reactors, mm. or two years after, if they were the modern larger plants. So going to your question then about capacity. So um, if, for example, they were small modular reactors, and it will be the independent um, nuclear energy coordinating authority mm. that will advise on the specific technology and then the capacity. But I'm, I'm going to give you a round example. So with that disclaimer, an example. If it were small modular reactors um, and you're talking about um, two plants, uh, you could see up to um, 1.8 gigawatts of capacity from those two plants if they were SMRs. Um, and so, right. um, of course, if they were larger plants, it's far more than that. Now, right, but as SMRs you look are going to take we are a now, lot longer, aren't they? No, 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 not really. Um, in, in fact, because they are smaller, uh, they are modular, mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons they've been designed in the first place is you can collapse the time of actually standing them up and making them okay. work. Um, uh, e even the larger, actually, the modern larger plants are, uh, are far smaller than, than the old former generations. We're not interested in the old stuff. We only want the new stuff, which is generation three and beyond. Um, and the timelines we are looking at are very consistent with the International Atomic Energy Agency's recommendation mm -hmm. and the Australian government's own advisor, ANSTO, um, in this space. So it's completely consistent with, with best practice advice. OK. OK, a lot of detail, and we're going to discuss that in the months ahead because you are not giving it to me today, but I will keep on trying, Ted O'Brien. Uh, just one final question here. Um, if you're seeking a mandate, and, and this is a big one, I've not seen an election like this since my time reporting uh, politics, if this is the way it's going to go, a big, bold idea. Some have called it crazy brave. If the coalition loses the next election, but most importantly, loses some ground in these seats where these proposals, this proposal is, will you drop it? Will you seek a different solution and bipartisanship? So, Laura, our plan is to seek a mandate from the Australian people and there are far better political commentators and you're one of them. Um, who, who can provide lots of good commentary about hypotheticals of depending what seats are won and lost and, and so forth. Uh, my focus and the reason we're doing this under Peter Dutton's leadership is we have to focus on what's in the national interest. Is this a challenging, big, bold policy idea? It is, and we are doing it because it is in the interests of our nation and the people we serve. Um, and so we have to prosecute the case, unashamedly so, but mm. that's why we're doing it. As for political commentary, uh, you're far better that and, than I. <laughs> OK, thanks. I'll take that compliment. I'll see you soon, and uh, we'll try and get some detail from you Thanks in very the much, Laura. months ahead.